Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the Old Testament book of Amos. The Old Testament book of Amos and Amos in chapter number 4. The book of Amos in chapter number 4. The book of Amos is what in a section of the Bible that we call the Minor Prophets. And to be honest, the Minor Prophets are a section of the Bible that most people are not familiar with at all. The reason why is because they are minor in size but they are major in message. They have a lot of prophecy. They have a lot of things of history. And so those are some things that we have to have a background on in order to get the full understanding of it. But that's the whole purpose of this series is that we're just giving you a taste. Of course, with the lineup that we have going through it Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, it's not enough to survey all of these books. For example, the book of Amos has nine chapters. We're only spending three messages on it. So the best we could do is give you an overview, give you a taste. So that way, when you read it for yourself, you have a better understanding and you could pull more out of it. And so if you don't mind, hopefully you found your way to the book of Amos. We'll be looking at Amos in chapter number 4. The book of Amos, chapter 4, and if you're still having trouble finding it, you can always look in your index, but it's also right before the book of Obadiah. So if you hit the book of Obadiah, you get pretty close. For those of you who know the books of the Bible, Obadiah is only one chapter, so it's pretty hard to find, but it it is all right. Good. It's fine to smile at church. You are allowed All right, there's nothing saying that you have to look grumpy at church. All right, look with me, if you don't mind, in the book of Amos in chapter number four. The book of Amos, chapter number four, and notice with me, if you don't mind, starting at verse number one. The book of Amos, chapter four, and verse one. Hear this word, ye kind of Bashan, that there are in the mountains of Samaria which oppress the poor, which crush the needy, which say to their masters, Bring and let us drink. The Lord God hath sore by his holiness that lo, the day shall come upon you that he will take you away with hooks and your posterity with fish hooks. And ye shall go out at the breaches, every cow that is <laughs> that which is before her, and ye shall cast them into the palace, saith the Lord. Come to Bethel and transgress. At Gilgal multiply your transgression, and bring your sacrifices every morning, and your tithes after three years, <clears throat> and offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven. And proclaim and publish the free offering. For this liketh you, O ye children of Israel, saith the Lord God. And I also have given you cleanness of teeth in all of your cities. And want of bread in all your places. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. And also I have withholden the rain from you. And there were yet three months to harvest. And I caused it to rain upon one city. And caused it not to rain upon another city. And one piece was rained upon. And the piece whereon it rained not withered. So two or three cities wandered into one city to drink water. But they were not satisfied. Yet ye have not returned unto me saith the Lord. I have smitten you with blasting and mildew. And when your gardens and your vineyards and your fig trees and your olive trees increased and the palmer worm devoured them, yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. I have sent among you pestilence after the manner of Egypt And your young men have I slain with the sword. And I have taken away your horses. And I have made the stink of your camps to come up into your nostrils. Yet you have not returned unto me, saith the Lord. I have overthrown some of you as God overthrown Sodom and Gomorrah. And ye were as a firebrand plucked out of the burning. Yet ye have not returned unto me. Therefore... 
Thus will I do unto thee, O Israel, and because I will do this unto thee, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. For lo, he hath he that formeth the winds, and createth the wind, and declared unto man what is his thought, and maketh the morning darkness, and treadeth upon the high places of the earth, the Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. And if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, would you mark what is perhaps one of the scariest phrases ever to be uttered inside of the word of God? Inside of the Word of God, you find the book of Amos, chapter 4. One of the scariest phrases in all of the Word of God is verse number 12. The phrase, prepare to meet thy God. Prepare to meet thy God. And with the Lord's help, we want to open up the book of Amos and give you an understanding of what God is declaring here when he says, prepare to meet thy God. Let's go to the Lord together. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for you being a wonderful God. A God who does indeed love us so very much. A God who cares for us and desires the best. You don't desire the worst for us. You desire the best. However, because of our disobedience, because we refuse to obey, we refuse to seek after you, we refuse to turn to you, that you have to get our attention and even if we still don't return to you, there's a time where you've had enough. And we understand that. Help us to have our eyes open. As we talked about before about the word of God that is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. We're asking that it would show a mirror and reflect our true image. That we can see us as you see us. And that we could change our ways. Help us now. Let this be a help. Again, I recognize that we are needing your power to give us understanding in a message like this. So the best I know how, I surrender myself to you. I beg for you to fill me with your Holy Spirit. And I beg for you to do your own work through your precious word. We do love you. And we thank you for all that you do. In your name we pray. Amen. What an amazing passage. Prepare to meet thy God. You know, people are constantly preparing for big days. They're preparing for graduations and educational things. They prepare for investments. Before I invest, they prepare how to do it. They prepare for a wedding. Before you get wedding, these are the things that need to be done and flowers need to be ordered and invitations need to be set. There is a lot of preparation that we do. Unfortunately, the most important thing we fail to prepare for we fail to prepare to meet our God. The word prepared means to be established, to be ready. Are you ready to meet God? Are you established? Do you have things organized and set up so you can meet God? That's an important thing. But yet, it is something that most people don't have any regard to do. But it is a true statement that everyone will meet God one day. Everyone will stand before him and give an account. You will be judged by God one day. You know, one of the reasons why people don't prepare to meet with God is because there's no fear of God before their eyes. May I say it simply? They just don't care. I don't care what God says. I don't care what he thinks. I don't care if I have to stand before him. There's no fear of God before their eyes. Someone can say, well, it's, it happens, it happens. What a horrible, horrible sentiment. You understand the most important time that will ever occur to you is when you stand before God. This is a big deal. As we go through the book of Amos, we understand that the book of Amos is covering the northern kingdom of Samaria, the northern kingdom of Israel. And in it, it is a very prosperous time. Everything's going great. In fact, the borders of Israel and Judah are established. They have the surrounding kingdoms in tribute to them. The rest of the kingdoms are looking up to them. They are not threatened. Their economics are the best there ever been. Everyone's happy. They're making plans for the future. But they're doing everything but looking to God. 
We understand that Hosea was also to the northern kingdom and that it was trying to prepare the Lord, uh, people to the Lord. And the book of Hosea took the kinder approach. It went and emphasized the love of God. And it said over and over, no matter what you've done, God loves you. And by the way, that's a true statement. And it tried to use the love of God to bring people. Well, the book of Amos takes a different approach. The book of Amos has a southern preacher who goes up north to go preach to all those Yankees, I mean to the northern kingdom of Samaria. And tr with it, he has some good southern preaching, Amen. some blasting preaching, some very hard preaching, some harsh preaching. And may I say a style that's not normally taught in seminaries, sarcastic preaching. He's doing it to try to place an emphasis in a point of how they are not ready to meet God and how God is trying to get their attention over and over and over. And they just ignore it. God has done everything to wave them down. And they're like, we're fine. We're good. We'll deal with it later. It's not important to deal with now. What has happened because they have no fear of God before their eyes. They've replaced the God of the Bible with their own image of who God is. They replace the God of the Bible with a series of other gods. If we look at America, could you imagine the other gods that America has? Their own image of who God is. They have the God of religion, which is not the God of the Bible. They have the God of Hollywood. They have the God of their own thinking. The God of their own mind and imagination. The God of their own gospel singing groups. And all of these are replacing the God of the Bible with a false image of God. And they'd rather think of the wonderful God of the singing groups rather than meet the God of the Bible. You understand? The fear of God comes with our knowledge and intimacy of who God is. And when you've replaced him with a false God, then you're no longer ready to meet that God. It's not that big of a deal. Most people have an image of God that he's like a salt and peppered haired grandpa that when he sees us sin, oh, it's all right. You can't help yourself. Here's a piece of candy. And they have that image of a grandfatherly one who no matter what, he just turns a blind eye. But God wants so much more for us than just that. Amen. And so the emphasis of Amos is the idea Prepare to meet thy God. And so if you don't mind, let's go ahead and let's examine Amos. And let's see some things here with the idea to prepare to meet thy God. The first thing I want to bring to your attention is the God we're going to meet. The God we are going to meet. Notice with me at verse number 12. Therefore, thus will I do unto thee, O Israel, and because I will do this unto thee, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. So verse number 12 gives the emphasis, you're going to meet your God. Verse number 13 explains, what is this God? Who is this God that we're going to meet? Well, who is this God? Well, he's the God of great power and the God of creation. He's the God of great power and the God of creation. Verse number 13. For lo, he that formeth the mountains and created the wind. You understand the God that we're going to meet is not just some little piddly God. He is the God who created the entire world. You understand how amazing the world is? That our world is in perfect harmony. And this one disruption would destroy our world. You think about the earth. That the earth, if it was any closer to the sun, it would be so hot that life couldn't exist. If it was further away from the sun, it would be too cold for life to exist. You cover the moon. The moon helps control our tides. But you know if the moon was closer, it would actually flood the earth. Four times a day? That's pretty uncomfortable. We can only drown comfortably once a day. You understand the idea of how perfect harmony that God has made and what great power and great wisdom that God has placed to make the world, whether it's mountains or to make life, to make the atmosphere that we could breathe in and live in. There is so much to study. And it is the, this God who created it. We're not talking about a little statue or a picture that makes an imagination of God. We're talking about the real God who created everything. 
That is the God that we have to stand before and give an account. The God who made everything. I mean, that's a different thing. To If you're going to go meet with some little G God, well, what's he going to do? Well, the big G God who created everything, that's different. He has every power. And by the way, because he created everything, he has every right to, to judge and to determine what to do with what he created. He has every authorization to do with what he owns. If he created it, he owns it. He has every right to evaluate, to judge, to look over his creation. What about what else about this God that we learn of? We understand that he's the God of knowledge. He's the God of knowledge. Notice in verse 13. For lo, he that formeth the mountains and created the wind and declareth unto man... What is his thought? Do you understand that God knows what you are thinking? And he knows why you are thinking it. The Bible declares there is nowhere you can go that God can't see you. You ever wonder why so many sin, no, why so many people sin with the lights off in darkness? Because there's an unconscious thing. We don't want people to see what we're doing. Well, let me tell you, God has perfect vision even in pitch black. He sees what you're doing. He knows what you're thinking. He knows everything about you. By the way, that is a comforting thought and a frightening thought. He knows everything. You can't hide anything from God. God knows what you're thinking and why. You may try to attempt to fool someone. You could put in a good paint of coat. I did that on purpose. You could get to the idea where you could make yourself look better, dress better, act better. But you could be so wicked inside. Who you truly are is who you are in private. When no one else is looking and God knows. Who you are may not even be who you are in front of your wife but who you are when you're by yourself in front of a computer screen that is who you are and God knows you he knows everything about you which once again is a comforting thought and a frightening thought and that is the God that you will have to stand before one day one day you'll stand before the God of creation the God who created everything and give an account as his creation You will stand before a God one day who knows everything you've ever thought and he knows everything about you. And the message is prepare to meet thy God. What else about this God? He's the God of wrath. He's the God of wrath. Notice in verse 13. For lo, he that formeth the mountains and created the wind and declareth unto man what his thought and maketh the morning darkness And treadeth upon the high places of the earth. Now, in the ancient world especially, people would put their most sacred worship sites on mountains. And there was some unconscious idea with the idea that the higher I can go, the closer I'll be with God. However, their worship sites would often be false worship. In the Bible, there would be the idea of groves and high places. And those would be places where they would go to commit sexual sins in quote-unquote worship to these false gods. And here it says, our God is able to tread upon the high places. He steps on those places. He's bigger than all of those other things. Someone may set up a false worship. Let me tell you, our God is bigger all of that. And it makes him sick, by the way. Most religion makes God sick. What is religion, by the way? If we want to have just a basic definition, it is a system of work saying that I must do something in order to be right with God. You understand God loved you so much that he sent his son to die for you. God just wants you to look up at him and respond to him after what he's already done for you. And God is God who hates all of this false religion. All of these false gods, these false ways of making us look. Let me also tell you, as we understand that God is a God of great power and of the creator God. He's the God of knowledge. He knows everything about you. He's the God of wrath. He hates sin and he hates the false religion. But we also understand here is that God is the God who's able to do something about it. God is the God who's able to do something about it. Notice again at verse 13. 
For lo, he that formeth the mountains and createth the wind, and declareth unto man what is his thought, and maketh the morning darkness, and treadeth upon the high places of the earth. The Lord, the Lord, the God of hosts is his name's. I love the names of God because the more that you learn the names of God, the more you can understand about God. And he uses his names specifically for different passages. When it speaks about the Lord of hosts, this is the name of God that means the God of all of the armies of heaven. The Lord of hosts carries the idea that he is the God, the captain, the general of all of the armies of heaven. Sometimes you'll say, well, You and what army? Well, God says, I'm in charge of all the armies of heaven. What are you going to do? Sometimes we get the idea that God doesn't have the authority or the power to do anything about it. Let me tell you, he does. And he can. And one day you will stand before God and you're going to give an account for all of your life. And he's authorized because he created you. He could do with what he wants in his creation. He can because he knows everything about you. He has perfect knowledge. He could do all of it. He can because he's the God of wrath. He's a God who hates sin and he hates false religion. And he can because he has the power to do so. He has the ability to do so. And one day everyone will stand before this God. And they will give an account for their life. You understand the message that is given here. Is that you need to prepare to meet that God. That is the God that you need to prepare to meet. So with that, as we examine the text some more, we started off by the God that we're going to meet. But let's go back to the text and let's just explain from the text from here as Amos is preaching to these people the reasons why we're going to meet God. The reasons why we're going to meet this God. Now, he's speaking to the children of Israel, the northern kingdom of Samaria, And he's addressing them with some of the things that is going wrong of why they're going to stand before judgment. Why God is going to judge their nation and them as a people. Why is it? Well, first of all, because life had become a great party. Life had become a great party. Oh, it became all about entertainment. Remember, at the time that Amos is preaching, Israel is prosperous. People are happy. The borders are secure. Business is doing well. We have money available. We have time available. We don't have to work so hard. We can enjoy ourselves. May we just put beside it America. The land of the plenty. They're happy. Things are going well. Sure, we got to work, but everyone's got to work. But we don't have to work to survive. We're just working to enjoy life. We're working. We have the ability to do so. And so notice how they respond to this. Now again, this begins what is called sarcastic preaching. And there are going to be some things that we probably couldn't get away with today as a normal preacher without the concept. But he doesn't put any trenches here. Notice with me in verse number 1. Amos chapter 4 verse 1. Hear this word, ye kine of Bashan. The word kine means cow. In fact, in verse number three, he tells them again. He says, you should go out to the breaches. Every cow that is before him. He starts off and says, listen here, you bunch of cows. You bunch of cows. I mean, he's, somebody said, well, I'm offended. Well, he said, I'm trying to get your attention. What does a cow do? Just sits there, eats, enjoys life, lives for the moment. It's not worried about anything else. It's worried about making themselves happy. Pleasing themselves. They're just there. And he says, you bunch of cows. You're just taking, a, uh, taking life for granted. It's just a big party to you. Notice verse four, uh, 1 again. Chapter 4, verse 1. Hear this word, ye kind of Bashan, that are in the mountains of Samaria, which oppress the poor. You fat cows. Here's these poor people over here, and you just <laughs> eat all their stuff too. Oppress the poor, which crush the needy. Which say to their masters, bring and let us drink. You see, it was all about partying to them. All about them. Bring us more drink. Bring us more drink. We want to enjoy ourselves. He goes and places an emphasis. Bring us drink. It's a big party. It got to the place where alcohol was just such a ritual of life. Everyone has to have it. You know... It's amazing that even with downward turns, you looked after September 11th when we went through a recession. 
You know what business was not in a recession? Alcohol. You look at this last year, 2020, which is a crazy year. Business is going out. Little mom-pop showers. People are struggling. But you know what business was booming? Alcohol. In fact, they just released a study, a concerning study, just two weeks ago that said because of 2020, so many, there was a record number of teenage dementia that has been caused because of alcohol for teenagers. It's messed up their mind. That's what they turned to. Oh, we don't have anything else. Let's just drink. And they got to the place where alcohol was such a big deal of their life. Let's just party. Let's just enjoy ourselves. We just got to do this. We have the ability. Notice with me in verse 2. The Lord hath sworn by his holiness that lo, the day shall come upon you and he will take away you with hooks and your prosperity posterity with fish hooks. Now this is a prophecy. What is happening is that in a few short years, the Assyrian empire, who has been an empire for a while, it's under a, a wane, but it's fixing to wax and get stronger. And what's going to happen in a few short years, this big juggernaut of, of Assyria is going to come through and they are actually going to take them hostage. The Assyrian empire, the Nazis of the ancient world, and one of the things that they were known to do was to fillet people alive. And they would do it with fish hooks, by the way. They would actually hook them up and while they're still alive, peel their skin from them. And I'm giving you some history. We could give you a lot more evil things that they did. But you understand God is saying, this is what's going to happen. You think life is a big deal and you don't need God. Just party. Just enjoy life. Drink your liquor. Have a good time. Let's just live for the now. We'll not worry about everything else. And because there's no concern of God, the, the Israel is going to fall apart morally. It's already corrupt morally. It's going to fall apart. And God says, listen, there is a country that is coming because you're not right with God. And they're going to do horrible things to you. You know, we think of how great our country is. And we're thankful for what we have. And we look and say, you know what? We're so, what country is going to mess with us? That's what they thought at their time. They thought they, they were immune and they were invincible. And so let's live our life like we're invincible. Let's live our life like there's no consequences. Let's just party, drink, eat, be merry. Let's just have a good time. And God says, you don't understand what danger you're in. Prepare to meet thy God. You know, this all could have been avoided if they would have listened to God in the first place. As he gave them message after message after message. Verse number three. And ye shall go out at the breaches. The breaches carries the idea of the breaks in the wall. That their wall that was protecting their cities. They figured that would always stand. But here it's broken down. And they're going to go out. And the days shall come upon you. And he, um, verse number three. And he shall go out to the breaches. Every cow that is, which is before her. And ye shall cast them into the palace, saith the Lord. Here it's given the idea that everything that you're trusting in is going to be destroyed. You trust in your government, it's going to fail. You trust in your walls, it's going to break down. You trust in your life and invincibility, and you're going to be brought to nothing. Why are they going to meet with God? Well, first of all, because life had become a great party. Life had become a great party. What's another reason why God, they were going to meet their God? What other reason could they have that God was going to say, prepare to meet thy God? Second of all, we see, because they become fraudulent in their religion. They became fraudulent in their religion. Notice with me in verse number four. Come to Bethel and transgress. At Gilgal, multiply transgression. Now it brings up these two, uh, two cities to start off with. Bethel was the place where Jacob had his dream. And so the people would gather to the city of Bethel once a year. May we say it for this, for the revival meeting. This is where, this is where um, um, Jacob met his stuff. So everyone come and we'll sit and we'll do a religious service. We'll have a revival meeting and we'll just have a good time. And then you had Gilgal. Gilgal was the first place where uh, their first encampment in the promised land. The first place on the promised land where they had set up the, uh, the 
tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant and the temple. And they'd set up the court and they set this up. And it was their headquarters, religious headquarters for a while. Now as the northern kingdom is in its own kingdom, they didn't want people to go down to Jerusalem. Because if they go down to Jerusalem, they're actually going to hear the Bible. So what we're going to do is we're going to set up these sites on old religious uh, holy places. And we're going to have our revival meeting there at Bethel. And we're going to have our missions conference there at Gilgal. And once a year you come. And it carries the idea here. The people thought as long as they showed up to religious services. That they did God a favor. If I show up to church. I can live however I want. God will get off my back. I'm good. Let me tell you. You have not done God any favors by showing up here today. You haven't done some great act of service because you showed up to church. But yet people live their life. As long as I show up every once in a while, I don't even have to be regular. As long as I show up once in a while, God's happy with me. I could do, live my life however I want. Let me tell you, that's not true at all. It's not true at all, but people live their life that way. Oh, I could tell you stories of real life people, people that are close to me. I have a lady that I know very personally within my family who committed an adultery, lived a very wicked life, began to get further and further away, but still called herself a Christian. But she would show up on Sunday morning and sing the songs and get the lighter out and have her uh, uh, emotional experience, tears running down her eyes. God was so close to me, walk out the door and go back into her same sin. You understand, we go to church for God to change us. Amen. If we walk out of a church service and God hasn't changed us, something's wrong somewhere. Amen. The Bible talks about this same thing in the book of Jeremiah, both in chapter 6 and verse chapter, or chapter 8. He says, they have helped the hurt of my daughter slightly. Saying, they're there. <laughs> and giving them help when there was no help. And it made the idea that they came to the idea of a religious service. And the preacher says, it's fine. God likes you just how you are. Just smile and have a good day. And the people said, I like that preaching. Man, God likes me just as I am. And that I don't have to change my life. And so they get the pat on the head and they feel better. But it hasn't taken care of the problem. What is the problem? They're not right with God. And people do this today. They were doing it back then. They're doing it today. They show up to a religious service and they feel, I don't even have to be awake. <laughs> I just show up oh, and I can catch my nap. Preacher preaches about 40 minutes consistently. I can... <sighs> and every once in a while I wake up, amen! <laughs> and they feel if they showed up that things would be fine. That God's happy with them. And unfortunately they are not. Just because you show up to a religious service. Does not make you right with God. It doesn't replace anything. <laughs> Notice as it goes on. Verse number 4. Be come to Bethel and transgress. And Gilgal multiply transgression. And bring your sacrifices every morning. And your tithes after three years. And offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven. And proclaim and publish the free offerings. For this liketh you, O ye children of Israel, saith God. Now this is what is called sarcastic <laughs> preaching. Meaning that he is saying some things that he does not want them to do. But he says, well, <laughs> since you're at it, you might as well be consistent with your life. The people are saying, well, because I went to Bethel and I gave my sacrifice to Gilgal and I brought my offering. God must be impressed with me. I've done my token of religion for the day. And they become comfortable in their hypocrisy. They get comfortable in playing church. I know how to say the right things and do the right things and... God's happy with me. But notice exactly what he said. Come to Bethel and transgress. The word transgress means to sin. Well, what was this one of the sins mentioned before? They were drunken. So why don't you be consistent? All right? Don't play the hypocrite. The hypocrite means playing the part. Hey, be consistent. You like your alcohol? Why don't you just show up to a revival service, pop up a top, drink back while the preacher's preaching? That's called sarcastic preaching. Does he want him to do that? 
Nobody's pointing out their hypocrisy. You think it's fine to do it at home. You might as well do it here. That way you're not playing a lie. Be consistent. Right? Hey, at Gilgal, multiply your transgression. Hey, you watch that filthy, dirty movies over at home watching those videos on the internet? You might as well show up to our missions conference and watch it while the preacher's preaching. Be consistent. I mean, you're doing it at home, might as well bring it here. Does he really want you to bring your pornography at church? No, but he's pointing out, be consistent. Because who you are is not who you are in public. Who you are is who you are in private. He's saying, be consistent. Don't pretend that you're righteous and godly when you show up to church. How many times, we may speak of this by experience, that you're driving to church and it was World War III in your car. You couldn't fight, find the shoes. Where'd you put your shoes? How come you didn't up there? Stop hitting your sister. Behave. Why? And then you pull up to the parking lot, pull up in two wheels, open the door and smile. Hi, preacher. God's so good. Right? Be consistent. Well, the consistency shouldn't be bring your sin to church. It should be bringing your godly lifestyle and live it at home. Amen. Live right. Don't play the part. Live consistently. He's giving this idea that you should be consistent. You know, if you are truly a, just live who you are, just expose it. And people won't do that because they want, don't want people to know how wicked and evil they truly are when they're not here. Notice in verse number five, and offer a sacrifice with leaven. Now, this is important here because you say, well, it's saying offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving. I'm giving to the Lord and he shall be happy. But notice this with leaven. If you do a study on leaven, leaven is never referred to as a good thing in the Bible. Never, ever. It carry, the, if we were going to make some bread, and ladies, if you were going to make a roll that rised, what would you add? <coughs> Yeast. That is what leaven is. Leaven is an extra ingredient that you add to cause it to rise. By the way, what ingredient is add to most alcohols to make it alcoholic? Yeast. And so it's a picture of leaven. It is a picture of worldliness. It's a picture of corruption. So now notice that with the idea here. And offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven. Hey, be consistent. Go ahead. You offer your sacrifice, but you know, go ahead and offer it with all that junk that you put with it. Start mixing it together. It's fine. You know, we used to make jokes about... <coughs> um, that how the world is twisting everything. You know, soon we'll have Christian pornography. You know that's a thing now? Don't look it up. But you know that's a thing? Where people say, you know what? We want to watch pornography in a godly setting. There is no such animal. No such animal. And the people think, you know, let's just bring worldly things into the church. And let's mix it together. It doesn't work. And it's not acceptable unto God. God is saying, no, no, you cannot mix that into here. But this is what it's speaking about. You might as well do that. Be consistent. You watch that junk at home, well, go ahead and bring it to church too. That, again, that sarcastic preaching. It's not what he wants them to do. But he's pointing out that they're living inconsistent lives. No wonder they're going to stand before God. No wonder God says, prepare to meet thy God. It's because they're not living consistent lives. They're acting one way in public and acting a different way in private. Who we are is not who we are in public. Who we are is who we are in private. And by the way, God knows that. He knows your thoughts. He knows who you are. You may try to fool a preacher. You may try to fool church people. You'll never fool God. Notice something else in here. What's another reason why they're going to stand before God? They have to prepare to meet God. Well, first of all, we understand it is because... That their life had become a big party. We understand that second of all is because they were inconsistent. They become fraudulent in their religion. Notice something else. That you won't respond and listen to me. You won't respond 
and listen to me. Notice with me in verse number 6. And I want you to notice a phrase that is repeated four times as God starts in verse number 6 as he's trying to get their attention. Verse number 6. And I also have given you cleanness of teeth in all of your cities. Now this is a poetical way of saying you haven't eaten. You know, if you haven't eaten in a while, you don't have to clean your teeth. He says, you know what? I've made it so that way you couldn't eat. Famine, finances, whatever else. I brought this into your life and you have cleanness in all teeth, the want of bread in your places, yet you have not returned unto me. God says, I tried to get your attention. So I started off by taking it so you couldn't get things to eat. For a while I did, made it so you couldn't get anything to eat and you still wouldn't come back to me. Verse number seven, and also I have withholden rain from you. And when there were three months to harvest, I caused it to rain on one city and caused it not to rain on the other. Now, remember, this is an agricultural society. They're dependent on rain, especially since it is an arid desert type place. They need the rain. And so without the rain, they can't eat. And so God says, I caused it to rain here, but I didn't cause it to rain here. And I caused it so those two cities that didn't rain had to go to the one city to get food. Now no one has any food. And guess what? Verse number eight. So two or three cities wandered in one city to drink water, but they were not satisfied, meaning they didn't have enough water for everyone. Yet you have not returned to me. By the way, these are basic needs. God has messed with basic needs with the idea that, hey, I need water. Why not I talk to the God who could provide my basic needs? And they refuse to go to God. They refuse to go to him. I'd rather suffer and be miserable than turn to God and ask for help. You know how many people are like that? No professing Christians like that? God can help you out with so many things. And I won't go to him. No, I refuse to go to him. I'd rather suffer and be miserable than go to him. Verse number nine, I've smitten you with blasting and mildew. And when your gardens and your vineyards and your fig tree and your olive trees increased, the palmer worm devoured them. He says, you know what? I started to affect your living. So you have these plants that you're growing again, more of an agricultural society. I had dust and mildew. It took out some of them. And some of them that did grow, guess what? I had the locust and the grasshopper eat those. And guess what? Yet ye have not returned unto me Say the Lord. I've tried to get your attention. I've messed with your basic needs. I've base messed with your life. And you still refuse to come to me. And I can help you. I'm just trying to get your attention saying, look at me. I'm here. Look at me. And they refuse to look up. Refuse to look up. Verse number 10. I have sent among you the pestilence after the manner of Egypt. He said, I've sent things so Bad, it makes the thing, it reminds people of the plagues of Egypt. Your young men have I slain with a sword. I have taken away your horses. I have made the stink of your camps come up to your nostrils. Yet you have not returned unto me. Man, I've allowed your, your country to have some tragedies, some horrible things that hit, whether it was twin towers falling, or I try to do anything to get your attention, and you still refuse to come to me. Verse 11, I have overthrown some of you as God has overthrown Sodom and Gomorrah. And you have been a firebrand plucked out of the burning. Man, I've sent some disasters your way. Some human disasters, some terrorist things, some other things hit. And by the way, you've been saved like someone took a brand out of the fire and you pulled it out of the fire. He said, I've protected you from you being destroyed. And yet you refused to turn unto me. You refused. Yet, you have not. God says, I've done everything I can to say, I'm here. I love you. Look at me. Please look at me. And yet, you refused to return unto me. You won't respond and listen to me. When God's been waving his arms and saying, I want to help you. I want to be there for you. I want better for you. Just look at me. Look at me. And refused. No wonder the message was, prepare to meet thy God. Now, all of that was to get the attention. We need to ask the question now, how to be ready to meet thy God? We understand we've been pointing out the problem. Someone may say, okay, God's been trying to get my attention. How do I do this? I want to. How do I do this? Well, that's a great question. And we come to the book of Amos chapter number five. And Amos begins to teach a different message. Because he's got their attention now, how do we respond to God? How do we look? Well, notice with me, if you don't mind, 
in verse number 4. For thus saith the Lord unto the house of Israel, Seek ye me, and ye shall live. The answer is quite simple. Seek ye me. Once again in verse number 6. Seek the Lord, and ye shall live. Once again in verse number 8. Seek him. The message here is to seek God. To go look after him. To find him. God made a promise over and over. If you put forth the effort to look for him, he will be found. Some people think that playing, um, seeking after God's like playing spiritual hide and seek. That every time I look, he's just around the corner and I just always miss him. No, seeking after God is like playing hide and seek with my kids when they were little. Now I have three kids and they were always close together in age. So they always did everything together. I meant they hid together. They did things. They, they couldn't be separated. And so they're like, Daddy, can we go play hide and seek? Okay, fine. All right, Daddy, you count. All right, one, two, three. And then what you would hear is the pitter-patter of little feet together. Come on, come on, shoo. Hi, shh, pop. And you'd hear that. All right, 99, 100. Here, Eddie, you're not. Here I come. And so I go into the bedroom. All right, kids, are you in here? And you hear a little giggling under the table. <laughs> All right, let me go look. All right, I look at the closet. There you are. Oh, you're not in here. <laughs> All right, well, maybe I'll look in the bathroom. Are you in the bathroom? No, no, daddy. Okay, well, I guess they're not in here. I'll go look somewhere else. Look under the bed. So look, oh, there you guys are. Oh, you guys were hiding very well. Why did my kids hide? Were they hiding so I couldn't find them? They hid because they wanted to be found. They wanted me to put forth the effort to look. That's what God does. He is easily available to find. He just wants you to put forth the effort to go look for him. So God says, seek me and you will find me. It is a promise that is repeated over and over and over. He just wants you to put forth the effort to look for him. You know, some people who show up to church don't look for him. Stand up, sing the song, sit down, listen. Give, all right, preacher preaches, I wonder what I'm doing today, hmm, hmm, oh, preacher's over, okay, that's fine, see you guys later. There's no seeking for God whatsoever. They showed up, but they weren't there. God wants us to put forth the effort to look for him. God, I want to see you. I guarantee, by the way, this is why we start our services by starting with prayer. We want to start our services by purposely realizing we're looking for God. And if we look for God, he shows up every time because he promised. The times that God doesn't show up is because we weren't looking for him. The times that you showed up to church and didn't get anything out of it, it's not the preacher's fault if we open up the Bible as we should. It's because you didn't look for him. God just wants us to put forth the effort to look. And if we look, he will be found. God just wants us to seek after him. By the way, notice with me in verse number 5. Uh, Amos 5 verse 5. But seek not Bethel, nor enter into Gilgal, and pass not into Beersheba. Or for Gilgal shall surely go into captivity, and Bethel shall come to naught. What it's saying in verse number 5 in a poetical way is you don't seek God in the houses of religion. So where do you find God at? If, where do we seek God at? If it's not coming to the houses of religion, where do we find God at? Well, that's a great question. May I show you in the gospel record of John chapter 5. Where do we seek God? Where do we find him at? The gospel record of John chapter 5. It's a good question, by the way. Where do we seek him? Where do we find him? Where do we look? I've been looking for God. God, where are you at? And he doesn't show up. Where do I look? Notice with me, if you don't mind, John chapter 5. John chapter 5. I love the rustling of scriptures. I love it when people are looking. Amen. The gospel record of John chapter 5. That'll make even more sense in just a second. John chapter 5. And notice with me in verse number 39. Search the scriptures. For in them you think that you have eternal life. And they, the scriptures, are they which testify of me. Where do we find God? Through his word. Now, by the way, a 
Bible teaching church that opens the Bible, you're going to find God. Just because it's a house of worship doesn't mean that they're opening the scriptures. This is why we encourage everyone to have an open Bible with them at church so you could find it yourself. You shouldn't be dependent on me. You should look in the scriptures yourself in your own copy of the word of God because you need to seek after God and find him. And you find him in the word of God, in the scriptures. This is how we find him. You have to open the Bible up for yourself. You don't just go to a religious person and let them tell you. You find the Bible yourself. Now, God makes this uh, statement, prepare to meet your God. How do we prepare to find him? Search the scriptures. The greatest thing you could do on a daily basis is to be in the word of God for yourself. Let the scriptures speak to you. Let them teach you. Let them show you who they, you truly are. Let it have its power to do its surgery as we spoke about before. God can do his own work. And he could draw you close. He could fix you. He could deal with things in your life. But you have to look for him. Where do we find him at? In the scriptures. So let me ask you this question. What state are you at? Are you at the place where you're inconsistent at home and church? Are you a completely different person the way that you speak and act and watch than you are at church? Remember, who you are is not who you are in public. Who you are is who you are in private. That's who you are. But you understand God's trying to get your attention. You could go back and think, if you are honest with yourself, the times that God is trying to get your attention. You say, I can't think of a time. Well, how about today, where God sent an old-fashioned preacher to open up the Word of God and say, God's looking for you! All right, God's looking for you. And He's probably done some other things in your life. It could be trouble. It could be health things. It could be consequences of things that it showed up and this thing has showed up and this other thing showed up and it's piling on and you know what God's been saying look at me look at me I wonder what God's doing look at me well more things are just piling on things are getting look at me what more do you want look at me but how do we look at him search the scriptures that is where you learn of God That's where you find him. That's where he will show up. It's through the scriptures. Let me tell you, we all need to be prepared to meet God. You know, the very first thing that we need to be prepared for God was is have forgiveness of sins. If you don't know for sure that your sins are forgiven, then let me tell you, the greatest thing you could do is go seek after God and he will show you. It'd be my privilege to take the Bible and to show you from the Bible how you could know without a doubt that you could be ready to meet God for forgiveness of sins. How you could show up and he says, I paid for your sins, you're free and clear. That's what we need to know. For those of us who are living life, let me tell you, even after you're a Christian, you could live a Christian, uh, you could live your life as a Christian and never get close to God. And you're missing out because God wants you to say, look at me. I've got so much more for you. Maybe you're at a place where God has done this and done this. And you may not recognize that God's been trying to get your attention. But as we've been going through, maybe it is God's trying to get my attention. Between the truck breaking down and this health thing and this thing here and this thing here. And by the way, this thing. Maybe it's God saying, look at me. The greatest thing you could do today is say, God. I think you're trying to get my attention. Help me to be ready to listen and show me from your word. And he will. God wants everyone to be close to him. And you can be. He's that good of a God. By the way, none of this is because God is evil and mean. It is all because he is gracious and he loves you. And he wants you to be close to him. So let me ask you this. Are you ready? Are you prepared? To meet your God. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus. And I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness 
of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920-530-6308. Once again, that number is 920-530-6308. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you. Thank you.